All right, so listen in. All right, well, that's uh, all of it. We can now move on to uh, questions from the audience. So uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, pointing to people, and someone will bring the mic over. If you have a question, raise your hand up high. Well, I think he has to appeal to younger, younger voters. Hey, mm. speaking of the microphone. He has to appeal... <laughs> He, uh, he has to appeal to younger voters. That's what I meant by that remark. I, I, I you know, uh, I, I think that when you drill down on some of the demographics, uh, men versus women, uh, younger voters versus older voters, I think for, uh, for them to be successful, they've got to go across uh, a whole bunch of demographic categories that they don't quite have now. And as a political observer, I've got no skin in the game. I've, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I'm an equal liker, equal hater uh, when it comes to politics. Um, but I see that uh, if they, if the progressive conservatives want to be successful, they need to do some things that uh, that appeal to uh, more than just their base. And he's talking a lot to their base, doing a lot of things to their to their base, and that's why. Um, the Bill 18 example is phenomenal because that landmine was planted a couple of years ago that might come back to, to haunt them at some point. And, and again, um, I think the strategists of the progressive conservatives realize that and uh, yet, you know, in, 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 in some ranks they're viewed as being kind of the party still of rural Manitoba. They've got them. They need southwest, southeast, Winnipeg. They need they need seven six six ridings in Winnipeg to, to turn this thing, and uh, that's why I say they have to appeal to, to to voters more like the folks in this room. Not necessarily young people, but more women, more families, uh, more people who are just part of that sandwich generation who are worried about whether their kids are going to stay here in Manitoba uh, and whether their parents have good enough health care. Well, I'll, I'll mention that we're primarily because we're, we're supposed to be talking about the last uh, uh, year or so and the, the flaunting of the referendum occurred in uh, April of April of last year. So we, we can go back and, and talk about that. Um, the reason the PST is stuck around is because uh, as an issue, uh, largely is because the, uh, the progressive conservatives have done a good job of keeping it front and center via the court challenge, via extending the session uh, into last summer, uh, via the protest right up until the moment last December when the bill passed. It's been kept in the public eye, uh, and they have also harped on the, the idea that the government did this by skirting the rules, by changing the law, Governments don't break laws, they change the laws so that they're not breaking them. And that's what happened here. Uh, the Tories may uh, very well lose the court case. Uh, I fully expect the judge will say governments are free to change their own laws. Uh, politically though, the, the NDP will pay a price and this will be talked about for a, another two years. But as far as it being the big story, it was last year's big story and um, Chronically, what happens in our business is we move to the next shiny thing, you know. Uh, so yeah, it's still important, and it'll come back. Come campaign and pre-campaign time, it will come back. Um, but yeah, we're we're generally on to other things at this well, point. I'll, I'll I'll disagree with that because uh, I'm I myself, and I know other reporters have, have continued to dig into the rationale behind the PST, uh, the con the controversy over the Conference Board of Canada jobs estimates. Uh, from the PST, the fact that the government touted we're going to get this many jobs, but not subtracting the uh, net loss that you might expect from removing uh, $280 million out of people's pockets that they might otherwise spend at the local hardware store to create jobs. So I think uh, uh, reporters have kept on top of this story. We've, we've explored other angles and, and will continue to do so. James Turner, for anybody 
is wondering, uh, wants to know about this, the, uh, the census uh, dispute between the feds and the province over the undercounting of Manitobans. And actually, Dan Lett did a quite a good dissection of that in the paper not long ago. And the upshot is, yeah, there is something to it. Uh, but um, it's sort of a pissing match between um, the province and Stats Can. And StatsCan said, under our very specific rules of how we decide things and how we correct ourselves, we can't find a reason to do it. And the province says, we are clearly undercounting Manitobans. So the problem is, is what's the recourse? You know. So yes. So I think the short answer is yes. Steve? I, I, I don't see how this pays off politically for the, for the NDP, because even if you win that argument, you've won the fact that you're, you're highlighting the fact that we're dependent on transfer payments and that this is our hope that we get more money. Uh, somehow 18,000 people have been missed in the estimate of our population. We're entitled to more money. Uh, it's primarily equalization. Um, so we're, we're entitled to more transfer payments. Politically, I don't see how that uh, uh, pays off. I think the NEP would have done a better job highlighting flat transfer payments for things like health care. Uh, which are strictly uh, per capita, uh, they've, they've remained flat as healthcare costs continue to grow every year. There's, there's an argument to be made that all provinces are, are being shortchanged. Provinces are paying a higher proportion of healthcare costs and the federal government share is dropping over the long term. It's quite remarkable. Um, that might be a better argument than you missed 18,000 people. No, we didn't. There it is. I've run the math. If, if there is 18,000 people indeed missing, uh, the province's math does add up. It comes up to about $100 million, uh, given the formula. So the, the math does add up, but the province has not proven its case. No. You're the data geek. Yeah, except I don't believe in data privacy, actually, generally. I believe in mass openness of all government data. That's so, uh, provincially, there wasn't much discussion of, um, of privacy. I look to Steve because he knows all the, the ins and outs. But, um, and the flip side of that is the open data side of things. And there was virtually no discussion of that provincially this year. Um, so the short answer is no, not that, not that I can think of. Short answer is it's, it's federal jurisdiction. You might, see, you might see tactics like you did in 2011, where you had liberals uh, endorsing NDP candidates in ridings where they were afraid the Tories were going to win. It happened in Seine River and Kirkfield Park. Was there another one? Uh, two uh, Winnipeg suburban ridings where the Tories were polling very strongly. The NDP thought they were in trouble. All of a sudden, uh, Anita Neville and other long-term liberals uh, write in support of the NDP. Uh, writing off their own candidates, further hurting the Liberal cause. It, it was uh, baffling. Uh, it was part of the reason the Liberals finished the way they did, at 7% of the popular vote. So I think you'll see maybe measures like that. If the NDP could pull that off again, kudos to them. If the Liberals agree to it, they're crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was more personal, though. There, there was history there between the players involved. Mm -hmm. and, and whenever you see those types of endorsements, the first question I asked is, how was that person screwed over by that other person? You know what? No, seriously. You know, it, there's personalities that they get affected by this, and, and there's reasons why they do this. Sometimes it's tactics. Sometimes, yeah. more often than not, it's personal. And you, you'll see that liberal support. They flirted with 20% in the polls before in 2003 and 2005, after the 2003 election, and then they're back down to 12, 10, 7 percent come election time. They might stay higher this time, they've got, they're better organized, if they can raise funds, if they can get membership out, if they can get people out to bring people to the polls, uh, to help campaign, to run candidates who might live in the riding they're running in, that might help, um, but, you know, history has shown that they, they drop down from that 20%, that, and all that swings back to the NDP. If you look at the pro polls, there's a new pro poll coming up tomorrow, by the way, in the Free Press. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the pro polls, the Tories are, have not moved much. Even with the PST, they're pretty much, they're about four points above where they were on election day. 
Uh, what's happened is almost all the NDP support has swung to liberal or undecided. Yeah, but how soft is that? Very and again, um, and, and I don't mean, and, and this is where, where history comes into it, right? Um, Bukhari can say that, you know what, this guy and this guy you can't trust. You can trust me. I'm a new voice, I'm a new fresh face, I'm willing to listen. But uh, when it comes to ballot box behavior, are people voting then thinking, hmm, I'm going to give you the keys because you're not that person or that person? Or is it because I've established this bond of trust? Stephen Harper is successful not because he's liked. It's because people will trust him with some of the key decisions of the nation. Now, is provincial politics as, as delicate uh, a, a conversation and decision as a federal election? No, but there is that kind of, uh, that, that, that connection as well. And I also factor in the, do I want to have a beer with this person uh, phenomenon as well, because that, 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 the likability is important with a leader. And I think she has that. Um, but at some point, we're gonna really push her and we're gonna see, you know, is she um, one of the three that we would trust? Um, I remember Sharon Carstairs, and she was very good and could hold her own and in many cases kick the other two's asses. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the politics that led to that election as a surprise when you look back at history and go, okay, I could figure that out. Uh, you've got a novice leader here that may have Trudeau mania, but when push comes to shove, there's going to be a choice in this province. I'll be very interested to see whether or not, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say it right now, if the Liberals get two or three seats, I'd still be shocked, just the way Manitoba politics works. No, unfortunately. And typically I would be the one that would say the uncovered issue is poverty. That's, but I actually think it's gotten some press this year. And I think the province, to their credit, have moved slowly. Pallister says he'll even move more quickly on the, uh, the welfare housing amount. So they have moved, and we have the 10-year plan to end homelessness, we have, um, you know, uh, we have at-home chez soi and a lot of the um, Housing First stuff. There actually is, finally, I think, some policy work, some genuine policy work being done on the poverty issue. But it is totally never going to be a sellable issue in Seine River. And that is, I, I, and I think about that when I write poverty stories, because that's largely what I've done for the last year and a bit, um, is focus almost exclusively on, on poverty issues. And I just know that there's a whole schwack of readers that just aren't reading that stuff, because there's, there's the feeling pe poor people kind of secretly deserve to be poor. There's there's the, oh that's the north end I just drive through there on the way to the cottage. There's a whole there's a whole psychology about about how we talk about poverty in this city, and it's it ain't going to be an election issue I don't think. Um, has it ever been an election? Like man, I'm trying to think back to the last campaign. Was there one policy announcement about poverty? Maybe something to appease the base, but I I can't remember even what it would have been. Um, so, and to his credit, Pallister is talking about it. Like, he, you know, he's, he even said he would be vaguely open to a guaranteed annual income, um, which is like the Hugh Siegel idea, right? So, well, it's not his idea, but it, there, there is sort of red Tory circles that believe in that. So, so um, yeah, totally not going to be a campaign issue, um, but I have some twinge of hope that something is changing on that front. I, I'd argue that, that the housing allowance that's in income assistance has been talked about more in the past year than it has in the past decade. And it's because Brian Pallister pushed it. He signed up uh, early on to raise it to 75% of immediate market value. And he forced the NDP's hand on that. And the NDP agreed to it as well. So um, I think it's been talked a lot. Uh, in, in terms of press conferences, if you're watching TV, if you're watching visual media, uh, you'll notice that the government um, it has press conferences when there's something visual, a splash pad. The Merchant uh, Hotel. That will today. the Merchant Hotel. That will get cameras out. Um, and again, there's a, a anti-poverty initiative. When it's uh, raising social assistance rates, uh, there's not a great visual there. You can put up a graph, 
and um, depending on the medium, you'll get less attention because it's it's not visual. I'd also not accuse the NDP of, of never uh, of, uh, under promoting anything. They 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 renounced this actually several times. There've been a couple examples this week of of re reannouncements. I, I'd say we're outnumbered, for sure, and, and the, the difference grows every year. As, as you may have heard, the media industry is in a bit of a tough spot lately. Uh, there are fewer journalists around, and there are more communicators around. Over the long haul, we've seen a shift from where uh, there'd be a scrum when we all started out. There'd be a scrum and there'd be one or two communicators and ten journalists. And now, it's almost reversed. Um, so that there is uh, much more um, control. Politicians are more tightly controlled. I think we can all remember the days when if you wanted to talk to a cabinet minister, you knock on the door, open. If they weren't busy, they'd come talk to you. Uh, now you go through, there's a structure, cabinet communications. You can stand next to a politician if they're walking in the hall and say, hey, can I talk to you about that thing you were just talking about in question period? And they'll turn to their communications person and go, is that okay? <laughs> It depends on who. Um, they play a, a function, a communications function. Uh, there's one that will pitch me an idea, you know, so-and-so. Uh, today, for example, Teresa Oswald is in uh, San Diego at a conference. Uh, it was pitched to me, um, you know, they would ideally love a minister on live for five or ten minutes. And we say, well, no. Um, and, you know, it's a 45 second clip. Uh, I tend to tell our reporters, and I try to practice what I preach, is that it's got to be a meaningful press release. Just because it's in a press release doesn't mean it's news. Um, but what happens sometimes is that uh, we're still trying to settle in in this town, in this city, uh, about what is news and about that whole thirst for first and uh, it has to go on the web and you've got traditional media versus kind of fringe media that will break stories and you've got editors that are somewhat uncomfortable at times because they don't want to get beat to a story. So, you know, it's, it's kind of that dog and flea thing. Sometimes we're the dogs, sometimes we're the fleas. And, um, uh, you know, we're kind of three veteran journalists, we kind of know what the, the BS is and, and what not, it, what, 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 what's not. But yeah, there, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of communications people. But they serve a role, they serve a purpose. And, and they know that, you know, sometimes they can have a little bit of influence. But in the end, I, I think we're smart enough to tell the difference. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I'd say, yes, in short, we are swamped. Uh, uh, by uh, press releases. Most of them are totally boring and we ignore them. Um, but they do stand as a record um, of what the government has done. So I actually, I will almost never actually read a press release the day it comes into my email because I just assume it's boring and I don't care. But then I often go back and actually the, the provincial press release webpage is one of my top bookmarks because I'm like, okay, what did they do about the thing back in 2009? And you can search them. So they actually, much more than Hansard even, um, or Estimates or, you know, Orders and Council that nobody ever looks at, um, except maybe Steve. Uh, they stand much more as a, as a record of what the government has said and done and what their policy positions are. So, so they are valuable. Um, I would also say that as, and I can't believe I'm going to say a nice thing about sort of the NDP spin machine. It is not nearly as oppressive as it is federally or in other provinces. Um, we can still stand outside of the of the house um, after question period, and it is a rare day that a minister will not come out and talk to you. Um, and if I need a minister, I can usually get one. Almost more importantly, if I need a staffer, I can get one. If I need a bureaucrat to tell me okay, why is nutrient removal really important in this one thing but not in that thing? I can get them usually on the phone to tell me the background stuff. And, and we're, we're, we're all political animals and the political stuff is really important, but the policy stuff is too, and that's where you really do need 
the nerds, as I say, the, the actual policy experts and staffers, um, and you can usually get them. Um, and I think typically we have a fairly open and fairly trusting relationship with the cabinet communication staff. They drive us crazy many a day, but I also don't usually feel like I'm getting hosed by them or, or getting, like, if they're spinning, they're pretty obviously spinning and you know it. I, I've never been directly lied to, I don't think, by them. Um, so, which is more than I think most reporters can say federal, cover federal politics. So we, we still have a pretty good, in short, as bad as it is. All right, well, thank you uh, very much uh, for your questions. I think we're going to uh, wrap that up. That, wrap this up. I thought uh, this was uncensored and uh, totally awesome. I hope you'll all join me in thanking our panelists uh, for tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Royce, and thank you, Steve, Mary Agnes, and Richard. Uh, it was an outstanding panel. I would have enjoyed it. Uh, I think everyone heard it as well. And uh, I would normally invite you all to our next event, but our next event's in September. So hopefully you're on our email list, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you again for coming out, and please, once again, thank our guests.